only reason this project can exist is thanks to your support. So if you have the means and want to uphold the delivery of free online content on the academic study of esotericism, please consider pledging to my Patreon, sending one of PayPal donations or joining the channel as a member. All links in a pinned comment. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Puka and welcome to my symposium. As you know, I'm a PhD and a university lecturer and this is your online resource for the academic study of magic, esotericism and all things occult. Today I have a very, very special guest uh, here with me. We are at the conference of the European Association for the Study of Religions at the University of Pisa and with me is Professor Henrik Bogdan uh, from the University of Gothenburg. Gothenburg, yeah. Gothenburg. <laughs> And um, yeah, he's a very well-established scholar in the field of esotericism and he has published extensively on the matter. In fact, I will be putting here a few of his books and uh, do check out the info box because you will find links to those books as well. And th thank you so much for being here on Angela's Symposium, by the way. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, actually, you know that I um, I had been trying to have you on my channel for quite some time because I'm a, a fan of your work. Perhaps fan is not the right word, an admirer of your work, uh, but um, yeah, definitely. So I guess the, the first topic that I'd like to discuss with you, Henrik, is about the field of esotericism. So how did, did it all start and where, where are we at now? with uh, the study of esotericism? Uh, well, it started really in the, as far as I'm concerned, in, in the 1990s, when um, uh, more and more scholars started to self-identify as scholars with a focus on Western esotericism. Uh, there were, of course, many, many good scholars before that who uh, would uh, do research on alchemy or astrology or magic uh, or uh, theosophy, or um, yeah, Rosicrucianism, or whatever, uh, but it tended to have very specialized focus uh, and not to place their uh, subject matter within a broader context. Um, but in the 1990s, gradually, much thanks to the work of Antoine Febvre and other pioneers in the field, um, several scholars started to uh, approach it from a broader perspective from a historical critical perspective, placing these uh, subject matters uh, within their context, rather than studying as something unique and something odd or something um, uh, that has no prehistory and no following history. Uh, so when I started to do my, my, my PhD uh, in um, the late 1990s, it was really uh, a new field that opened up. Uh, so I've been lucky to be able to, to follow this development of this field, how it gradually has um, uh, been established as an important field of research, not only in religious studies, I'm historian of religions, but also history of ideas or uh, history in general. Uh, that's where it started, more as an historical focus. Um, and. Um, when a field is being established, it's being established in, in different steps. Uh, with courses being offered at universities, uh, with, a, um, uh, with positions, with a focus on esotericism, uh, with uh, book series, with uh, specialist journals, with conferences, with organizations, and so on. So, uh, this field has really, uh, in little more than 20 years uh, been remarkable uh, in its success in that sense um, but there are of course many uh, challenges yeah. uh, still <laughs> uh, it's still a young field compared to let's say the study of I don't know uh, the world religions like Buddhist or Hinduist or anything like that so esotericism is of course a, a, a new field but at the same time it's a very popular field you can see that for instance that here at, at PISA at the conference that we attended here that the, uh, the sessions that we had on esotericism were very well attended. A lot of people are interested in this field, even though they are not perhaps specialists in it. Uh, it attracts attention. Uh, it fills an important place in the study of religion, obviously. 
Yeah. yeah. There, there is something that I'm really happy about, the fact that esotericism is getting more attention and more scholarly recognition as well. Um, and it is also thanks to pioneers uh, such as yourself. Uh, and I know that you are also the secretary of the European Association for the Study of Western Historicism. So you have a very active and um, a central role uh, in, in the developing of the field. And where do you think the field is at, at the moment? Do, do you also see it growing from this moment onwards? Or I think it's natural, it's going to grow, uh, but it's not going to grow indefinitely, of course. Uh, there are limits to how many scholars, uh, and the limits is um, set to a certain extent by the structure of the universities. Uh, it, since all of us, nearly all of us, I would say, who uh, work in different ways with uh, esotericism, we do it from uh, the limits of the humanities. And of course there are huge problems facing the humanities across the world in, in terms of cutdowns, in terms of um, insecurity for, for young scholars, uh, in terms of postdocs, in terms of permanent positions and so on. So it's a very difficult situation across the world. Uh, and since esotericism is comparably a quite small field, it's even more difficult for young new field, uh, for the young scholars to continue uh, the careers. So you have to be better than everybody else in, in order to, to continue to have that possibility. Um, so that's one of the challenges. Um, um, yeah, so we'll see where we're going to go fr from here. But there are also other types of um, ways that the field is growing, I think, in the sense that uh, new perspectives are being added. We can see that gradually throughout these years. Um, Scholars from other disciplines are discovering esotericism and bringing in new theories and new methods into the study of esotericism, um, such as art, art history, literature studies, gender studies, um, lived religion, sociology of religion, psychology of religion. So there are many different new perspectives being added, also theology and, and uh, more classical, like church history and, and so on. So scholars with totally different uh, areas of specialization, um, uh, when they take an interest in the study of Western esotericism, the field is also growing, of course. Mm. And why, why would you say that uh, the study of esotericism is important? I mean, what kind of relevance do you think it has? Well, I think that here, uh, I mean, one of the leading scholars in the field is, of course, Walter Hanegraaff, and has been so for a long time and has, in many ways, um, uh, defined Western esotericism. Uh, and he argued that esotericism is um, rejected knowledge. Rejected knowledge. Uh, and he has a definitely a point here, I would definitely say, because much of what we are dis uh, discussing at our conferences and so on, something which has been, for various reasons, rejected from uh, the narrative of Western culture. Uh, and that means that there are blind spots, so there are uh, areas which, uh, important areas of traditions uh, that we don't properly know yet or understand yet. Uh, so it's the task of us to really to, to fill out those blanks. Um, and it's not that these are blanks that are insignificant. Uh, on the contrary, I think that many of these currents have had an, a large impact upon our self-identity uh, as a culture. Um, and usually when I talk to my students about this, well, I take uh, 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 Isaac Newton as an example of this. Um, so everybody knows Isaac Newton as the... Um, Any interest in alchemy? <laughs> no, no, no. More, more the, that uh, he's the father of uh, the, the, oh, yeah, scient yeah. the scientific worldview, in a sense. Uh, and that this has been problematic for a long time for historians of science, that uh, a large part of his uh, preserved papers uh, are not scientific. They are religious, hermetic, esoteric, alchemical papers, put it that way. Uh, and they were excluded from uh, uh, the collection of his scientific papers because they were seen as his personal papers. 
Whereas now, of course, now for, for, for quite some time now, um, scholars have seen that, well, you cannot exclude these papers because this is part of his whole work, that these two uh, aspects are not separable, they are integrated. Mm -hmm. um, that in order to understand his so-called religious or esoteric um, uh, writings, one needs to understand his uh, scientific uh, writings and vice versa. So by, by ignoring that side of his work, we don't have a full picture of that's such an important mm. person for Western culture. And we can continue to take example after example after example. Um, take for, um, in literature, we can take um, August Strindberg from Sweden. Uh, Strindberg, of course, is, is extremely well-known author uh, who went through a crisis uh, and um, uh, that crisis coincided in many ways with his interest in, in esotericism, uh, in, in, in French occultism at the time, uh, Martinist occultism and alchemy and, and so on. So we can see that he was using alchemical imagery and he was use, referring to this, uh, this particular strand of occultism in, in, in France for that period in his writings. And if one doesn't understand that context, one doesn't really understand that uh, mm -hmm. literature as well. Um, so that's why, so th this is that these are marginal human beings that haven't had an impact upon Western culture. No, no, this is people just like you and me or uh, people you know, uh, who, they're not odd or strange or crazy, uh, who have dealt with esotericism. Uh, so many times people have formed formed Western culture. Hmm. I think that this is a great point. So it's uh, in a way saying that ignoring the study of esotericism is not giving us a full, a complete picture of our culture. Because as long as we exclude, you know, an aspect of our culture, you, we don't have a full picture. And before the study of esotericism was part of the academic uh, scholarship, uh, excluding the esoteric elements of one author or one scientist or one researcher just because it didn't fit the current paradigm. Whereas now that uh, slowly but steadily historicism is being studied more academically, it feels like it is sort of allowing for this kind of space in the cultural discourse. Mm. Uh, to include those elements and therefore have a better picture of these cultural phenomena and religious phenomena and even like, um, you know, as you mentioned, Newton, you know, people see him just as a natural scientist and they don't put, in, they don't bring into the picture his interest in alchemy and other esoteric topics. Mm. So that's a bit like I don't know, um, <laughs> sort of cutting a leg <laughs> from a person just because you don't, you know, you don't want to see that leg. That's a bad example, but <laughs> no, but um, yeah, and, and I think it's for me and uh, as a scholar, I'm, I'm not only focused on Western esotericism. I'm focused on what I call alternative forms of religion. So that also includes uh, new religious movements and uh, secret societies and then Western esotericism. And many times these areas overlap, but I think what they all have in common is that they, these various perspectives or research areas, uh, they are about broadening the understanding of, of religion, and in this case, in, in the Western context then. Um, because if one look at um, um, the history of religions, uh, for a long time it, it has been treated as uh, the study of very monolithical traditions. Well, we have the world religions, okay, we have Christianity, and what is Christ Christianity? Yeah, we have the, the Roman Catholic Church, we have the Protestant churches, we have the Orthodox churches, and that's more or less it, in a sense. But of course, the new history of religions in Europe, they focus the diversity and the, the multitude of traditions that have existed and still ex exist. Also within those churches, of course, uh, there's not, never been only one voice, there are many voices. Um, and that's, I think, an important aspect of the study of Western esotericism, is that it can highlight a number of these voices. 
uh, to show the complexity, to show the multifaceted nature of, mm. of religion. Mm. So in a way it's like when you um, don't only study the dogmatic institutionalized religions, but you study religious phenomena that are more malleable and fluid, that it means that by studying them you also get an insight into how human culture is formed more generally because you know you don't have one central dogma that people are following so they are creating their own rules in a way uh, so that also gives us insight into um, culture formation and religious formation when you have a lack of a central a centralized dogma do you think that that do you agree with that yes I definitely agree with that and I think that's an important aspect to to, to show that um, there is this the study of religion is very messy in that sense. It's not a clear-cut science where everything is uh, easily explainable and where you have uh, clear-cut borders between uh, uh, various groups and various uh, currents and, and so on. No, everything goes into each other. Everything is interconnected. Uh, and, and one needs to try to navigate in these messy areas and try to follow it. Um, yeah. Hmm. Another thing that I wanted to discuss is that um, that's, I guess, also because I want to understand the matter better. I know that um, recently there has been um, discussion surrounding the definition of the study of esotericism as Western esotericism. So could you please um, allow me to better understand what the discussion was about uh, since, you know, at first uh, this field was called the study of Western historicism and to a certain extent it's still being called the study of Western historicism. So what's the debate about the Western thing mm. uh, all about? Mm. Well, it's, um, it's a discussion that has been going on for quite some time. Um, so it's not really a new discussion or a new perspective on, on Western esotericism to bring that matter uh, into the front. Um, and there are various ways why uh, the prefix Western in Western esotericism is problematic. One can look at it from, um, from a geographical perspective. So uh, where do you draw the line? Where does Western begin and where does Western end? Uh, so is it only Europe? Uh, is it uh, Europe and the, the US? Is it the English, French and German speaking worlds we're talking about? Or what is it that we're talking about? Is it the cultural heritage from the, uh, from the, the Greek uh, world? Or some, where do we draw, draw the line? So it's... Um, and th those are valid questions, of course, that one ne needs to discuss and to analyze and to uh, to try to uh, to be transparent. What you mean by that, as a scholar? Um, but there are also other aspects with Western, which has been raised, and that is that the very concept of Western is a uh, form of excluding the other, of of, of trying to uh, make a difference between the West and the East, for instance. Uh, and that this uh, artificial uh, difference then between the East and the West, uh, it's, it's a way of trying to um, exotify the East or trying to make it different from the, the West by emphasizing differences. So this is of course a more post-colonial perspective connected to that. Um, and again, if one continues that way, one can say that this is, has something to do with also with power and legitimacy. Uh, that you, uh, that we as Westerners, that Euro as Europeans somehow define uh, what to study in terms of the West and what to exclude in terms of the East and so on by uh, exotifying uh, the East. Um, and. This is just a few of the, of the various arguments that uh, exist for the problematic nature of the West. My position is that um, it's, um, I still tend to use uh, Western uh, since the subject matter that I'm studying is from <laughs> a European context, most of my uh, areas of research. Freemasonry, the new religious movements that I'm studying, or that they are part of, of the US. Um, 
So it's more for pragmatical reasons, really, that I think that this is, uh, works fine for me. Um, but of course I'm aware of the problems with the, the concept of Western. Uh, and I'm, I'm aware that the, the very idea of dividing Eastern and, and Western esotericism has emic or insider uh, uh, roots that goes back to the so-called hermetic reaction uh, in the 1880s uh, where occultists uh, reacted against theosophy and, and uh, the emphasis on, on so-called Eastern teachings. Uh, and that uh, societies like that the Hermetic Society or the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn mm -hmm. instead tried to um, construct or to, to uh, um, try to um, argue that there is a valid Western esoteric unbroken tradition going back all the way to ancient Egypt or and something like that uh, and try to focus on uh, what they believed was um, unique for this Western esoteric tradition, yeah, magic and Rosicrucianism, uh, Hermeticism, Kabbalah, that this was something unique and more suited for the Western mind, as it were. Um, and of course this is an emic construct of everything. Uh, but again, we as scholars, we are studying uh, in a certain way uh, uh, emic people. <laughs> uh, but then have to take the next step and look at it from a theoretical perspective and try to understand it. Um, yeah, and there, yeah, there are many other reasons uh, which one could uh, bring up also in, uh, for keeping the West, uh, as well as there are many reasons why I should drop it. Mm. You know, so I can see both perspectives. Uh, uh, although I'm, I'm so far. I'm not convinced completely yet to drop it. Hmm. Likewise, <laughs> um, at, at least based on the arguments I've seen so far, I, I agree with you in that um, what, what the idea of West and East um, is still meaningful and is still telling us something about different ways of seeing the world. Of course, they are generic terms and so you always need to contextualize uh, but um, I don't particularly see a colonialist outlook, you know, on, on the terms themselves. So, um, but I don't know, I might be wrong. <laughs> so far, I haven't heard any argument that uh, I, I found particularly persuasive as to why the idea of West is colonialist, just because you're calling it West. Um, why would West be better than, you know, the, the term West is not implying that West is better than East. And perhaps it is because the, the concept of West and East were created by Westerners. I don't know. Well, I think that the, the very idea of, of dividing uh, the East and the West in itself is problematic uh, uh, for various historical and for other reasons why this can be problematic to do so. Um, because such divisions have often tended to emphasize the differences mm. uh, and uh, differences in a verderande, um, uh, as we say in Swedish, uh, as um, where you put value into the differences, where uh, certain differences are valued as more positive, mm. our differences, uh, and other differences are valued as negative their differences. Mm. So it is us and them. Um, and um, but I, I think as uh, as long as you as a scholar are aware of that uh, and, and and don't shy away from it, so on the contrary, engage in it. Um, uh, well, I think that one has to do that. One has to, to face those issues. Um, and there are many good ways of, of, of doing that, of course. Um, but at the same time, I think it's important to, 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 to look at what are we as scholars actually doing. Um, we can look at, for instance, at the uh, presentations here at the four sessions that we had on esotericism, uh, the subject matter. Um, so what examples are we studying? What sort of currents or what sort of persons or what sort of practices are we studying? Uh, and we can also extend this to to the, all the conferences and the 
uh, the journals specialized in Western esotericism or the book series specialized in Western esotericism, just call it for what it is. I mean, most of the scholars focus on, on examples uh, or do research on uh, European uh, or North American uh, topics. Uh, or at least there are specialists in these areas might do comparative studies with other areas as well. Um, uh, and, and I think that's an honest way to say that, well, the main focus is on the West. Uh, and then we have other scholars, excellent scholars, very good scholars, who have this uh, uh, ability of, they are focusing on not only on one geographical area, but they are experts on other areas as well. Uh, and of course for them it becomes very problematic to, to label what they're doing. Yeah, you're doing Western esotericism. No, I'm doing esotericism. That's it. Um, I'm a sp specialist on, on Hindu Tantra or I'm a, a specialist on uh, Vajrayana Buddhism um, as well as a specialist on Western uh, forms of esotericism. Uh, and they have this more comparative approach to it, which I think is fascinating and, it's, and I think it's good that we're bringing back the comparative method, which um, within religious studies uh, became so criticized uh, yeah. when the, the school of Michel Jade crumbled uh, in, in the 1980s. Uh, for a long time it was impossible to do comparative study. It was seen as uh, some form of essentialist that you tried to find the essence into religion and tr tried to compare them and that where project itself was uh, uh, deeply uh, problematical. Uh, but now there's uh, new forms of comparative study coming and I think that it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating. I think it's great. I think that we need that. Uh, bring in that method again because it, uh, uh, the comparative study of religion is really one of the uh, founding perspectives in history of religions. Uh, so it's good it's coming back. Uh, but most of us in the field of Western esotericists don't have that expertise uh, and we should be honest about that, I think. I know there are certain scholars out there who are going to say, well, he's totally wrong, and that's fine. I mean, we can have different <laughs> opinions about this, I think, as long as we... Um, are in a conversation, in a fruitful kind of conversation. As long as we agree to disagree or that we can... It's, it's fine to have different opinions. It's fine to, to, uh, to uh, want to drop Western. Uh, it's fine to want to keep Western. It's, uh, nobody should tell the other one what you have to do. And, but those tendencies I don't like, where there's some sort of moral uh, dimension being connected to the discussion, whereas uh, one way is seen as, seen as more moral superior than another way of approaching it. Uh, that I react against, and I, I don't think that that has a place in academia. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree. <laughs> And since the conference was about resilience, religious resilience, and of course the, the, our panels were about resilient esotericism, why do you think that esotericism has been so resilient over the, the centuries? And now the scholars of esotericism are resilient because it's difficult to, <laughs> to make your way into academia, so you have to be very resilient. <laughs> Well, if we learn something now from these four <laughs> sessions, uh, it's it's difficult to to really uh, answer that question <laughs> in an easy way. As yeah. always uh, in uh, hum humanities, when we analyze something, we're going to see that there are many, many different answers to that. Um, and uh, what do we mean by resilience in terms of esotericism? Uh, the, is it the ability to to stick around, not to go away, to survive, or is it the ability to change, to adapt to new interpretations? Um, um, I think that one reason why uh, many forms of esotericism tend to, to survive, tend to, to um, uh, be reinterpreted, is that Esotericism, in many ways, can be characterized as non-dogmatic, in the sense that it's um, there's an openness for individual interpretations. Uh, 
uh, there's an openness for um, new ways of approaching let's say esoteric symbols. I'm going to take one example here to explain what I mean by that and that is one of my research areas is the study of Freemasonry and this is actually one of the points I made in together with Jan Schnook when we published the uh, uh, the Brill Handbook on Freemasonry in our introduction. Um, we argue that yeah, the very fact that Freemasonry is non-dogmatic might explain why Freemasonry has survived for 300 years. Uh, that is that the rituals uh, of Freemasonry um, have tended to remain the same. Okay, they, they're, they have developed during the 18th century, but generally you can say that are, the, the basic structure has remained the same. Uh, the symbols have remained the same. The basic concept of Freemasonry uh, has remained the same. Um, and if we look at Freemasonry in the early 18th century and, and, and onwards, one will see that there's never been one way of interpreting Freemasonry. Uh, the symbols of Freemasonry, the rituals of Freemasonry. There's always been different ways. There has been uh, uh, religious interpretations of uh, the rituals of Freemasonry. Uh, there has been uh, philosophical interpretations, there has been moral interpretations, there has been esoteric interpretations, there has been political interpretations, and many times these different interpretations have coexisted within the same lodge, within the same systems. So I think that's one of the strengths of Freemasonry, um, in that it has this non-dogmatic uh, uh, nature. Uh, where new interpretations have been possible to, to make uh, and uh, where new generations of Masons have read uh, new things in those uh, rituals that we do, were going through uh, where individuals can read in their own interpretations of, of the rituals uh, and where that's often perfectly fine of course there have been conflicts with information with different systems and so on but usually hasn't been about interpreting the, the symbols. There's been other uh, conflicts connected to authority or power or jurisdiction and th th those sort of uh, issues. Not so much about how to interpret the symbols. Um, and I think that we can take this example and perhaps apply it to many forms of esotericism. This uh, ability to be of being reinterpreted. Uh, there's never been um, let's say like a um, formalized church in that sense but an official doctrine that one have to follow uh, if you break this uh, this doctrine in different ways uh, that you can be expelled from it uh, in terms of doctrine um, but of course you can be expelled from esoteric societies <laughs> uh, that's uh, that's part of, of esotericism also to be expelled but uh, often it has not to do with the, 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 the official doctrine that you, uh, uh, for instance, that we can as associate with, with churches in that sense. Hmm. And um, based on your, on your research, um, why do you think uh, there's such a, such a central role of magic in, in esotericism? in esoteric practices why is magic so central and important i know that there are some traditions where magic is not as central really but uh, across the boards it, ten it tends to be one of the core traits or perhaps you disagree with that <laughs> no i'm thinking Paul, what you're saying if it's central i think it's yeah it's central to to uh, to certain currents of, of esotericism uh, but not all as you say i mean let's take uh, the largest uh, occult organization uh, for a long time uh, in the world, the Theosophical Society, there will you, you will not find magic uh, as a central practice of uh, Theosophy. On the contrary, uh, magic is uh, deeply problematic for uh, in the history of, of Theosophy. Um, but if we look at magic as a practice, uh, why is it um, so um, resilient, why has it survived and being reinterpreted? 
So I would say it's, it's, it fulfills a very important function, uh, just like religion does, uh, in the sense that magic is often concerned with control, uh, of uh, having control of yourself, having control of your, uh, uh, your surroundings, uh, of your future. Uh, of trying to control what's going to happen to you and that gives you a sense of uh, yes if you have control a sense of relief right uh, so I think that fulfills an important function and, and in that sense it's it's uh, it doesn't differ from why has religion survived why is religion still an important factor uh, for humans today uh, because it does the same thing it creates order out of chaos uh, and that's what religions do. If you go back and look at, uh, I mean, the, the, the very word of religion uh, to binds things together. Uh, it, what it does, it, it binds human be beings together. Uh, it binds the individual together with with history. Uh, it binds uh, human beings together with nature, uh, with the future. If you have this linear. Uh, uh, Traditions like Christianity or Judaism or yeah. Islam. If you're part of a tradition, you're part of something in a way. Yes, and it, it, it explains why we are here. It explains uh, what I'm supposed to do and explains what's right and wrong. Uh, so, and that gives you a control. Uh, so, I think that's um, has, from a functionalistic perspective, then I think that religion um, uh, definitely fulfills that, um, that objective. Uh, as well as magic. Magic is, is, is dealing with the same thing, but this is, if we turn up the volume a, a bit more, I would say, magic is even more emphasized on this, uh, because you, you take on even more responsibility on your shoulders as a magician, of your control of your own existence, um, where what we can see historically and, and uh, also in contemporary forms of magic, that rather than re relying on on supernatural beings in terms of religion that they might help you if, if you if you please them enough uh, here you, t you take control of your own destiny in many ways uh, as a magician um, especially in more modern forms of magic I would argue yeah sometimes I wonder is that empowering or is that another constraint that people put on themselves you know having control over your life on one uh, on one hand it seems like something empowering but on the other hand it's like everything that happens is in a way your fault everything bad that happens is in a way your fault so i think there's I uh, there's two sides to it of course um like like everything <laughs> uh, there's uh, both negative and after, negative and positive aspects of this for for human beings um it can be empowering definitely for uh, otherwise i think that magic would not exist uh, i think that would have been you know, disappeared uh, by now uh, but obviously many people feel that this gives them something uh, that in their world this this is something that works for them mm. uh, just like religion works for many many uh, human beings um, um, but of course, also we have the, the difference with uh, tradition. Uh, if you are brought up in a context where everybody is part of religious tradition, uh, you might not perhaps reflect upon questions of empowering, as perhaps people do who practice magic, where you uh, often make a conscious choice to start to practice magic. Right? This is not something that you are. Uh, this is something I think that Bankers and Otto mentioned this at one of our uh, uh, panels uh, that uh, practitioners of magic can be seen as first generation uh, uh, belonging to first generation religion, like a new religious movement, in the sense that yeah, you have converted to this. You are not brought up with it. It's very few, I think, uh, practitioners of magic that have been brought up where it's uh, uh, something that comes through tradition that they practice magic. That's something that you choose to do. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, the question of empowering is probably central to, to that choice. Mm. It's interesting. I think that um, many scholars have pointed out the, the matter of control being one of the things that 
bring people to practice to practice magic um, in my case for example in my study and in my research uh, what I saw is that uh, in a lot of cases it's more a matter of experiencing what lies beyond so having a direct experience, perhaps it is because I, I did my PhD on shamanism and this kind of practices that have, that include some form of magic, but it is a, a form of magic that uh, even though you can, you know, get uh, healing and knowledge and power out of it, it, it seems as though practitioners engage with these practices more because they want to experience something that goes beyond this the ordinary reality mm. so it's like if there is a non-ordinary reality i want to feel it i want to experience it mm. so and there is this sort of uh, dimension of um wanting more from what you see mm. and uh, but it also links to what you were saying about religion binding things together because it's like um, most practitioners, most of my informants, uh, they have said in uh, our interviews, they feel a sense of connection mm -hmm. and also that they get to experience something that goes beyond the, you know, the mundane. Uh, and it, it often it is, you know, still linked to the mundane, but then it goes, you know, beyond it uh, yeah. to experience something more. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a good point. Um, I think that the uh, the issue of empowering depends also what type of magic we're talking about mm -hmm. and what we mean by, by magic. Um, so, for instance, let's take if we take um, uh, astral travels, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's probably not so much about empowerment. That's probably more about exploring the astral world and and trying to get deeper understanding of. Uh, I don't know of who you are or yeah. uh, what is that you can do as a human being <laughs> yes and and uh, to try to understand uh, the visions that you encounter what meaning they might have and and so on um, so you're right yes of course there's also this enchanting aspect about it that um, maybe magic um, uh, can be seen as a way of um, not of escaping um, uh, this uh, secular world, but of more of uh, deepening um, uh, the sense of um, relevance or the sense of, uh, uh, of mystery. Yeah, yeah that, that there is there's more to it than the surface uh, to go beyond the surface in a sense. So that's probably an, an yeah an important aspect of it as well. Mm. Yeah, and I was. I, I thought perhaps that is a an aspect that is empowering without having the, you know, the restraint that um, you know having the control brings about. Like the idea, okay, I'm the, um, I'm, uh, you know, I can create my own reality, but that means that also all the the things that happen to me are in a way caused by me or mm. because I, I I wasn't able to be a good enough magician so that places a lot of responsibility on the shoulder of the magician as mm. you mentioned earlier uh, yeah well it's it's a s similar phenomenon to certain forms of Pentecostal religion or Christianity uh, where the belief is that if you're you know, um, connected g close enough to God and you perform your prayers and if you are you know, on the good side uh, nothing bad will happen to you but if you get sick it's your own fault then you haven't uh, you have sinned in, in one way or another uh, so and that of course puts an extra stress upon you uh, and it's also um, uh, brings in the question of shame also if you are in, in, in a group setting or a group community uh, that somebody gets ill uh, and if you have this belief that um, illness is only afflicts those who are uh, sinful, then you became ostracized as well. So that's yeah. Yeah. Not only do you you have to endure the fact that you are sick, but also <laughs> that you're responsible for it. It sounds yeah. like a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> But yeah, I guess that our conversation uh, showed what you said to begin with, uh, which is that uh, the matter is very complex. And I actually, uh, I know that, um, you know, some people 
may prefer to have clear-cut answers and perhaps it is uh, it may seem annoying that in humanities and in religious studies we never had a clear-cut answer yes or no it is always complex and always multifaceted but actually I think that that is a good thing because uh, perhaps the you know it could be the case that our objective and our aim is not really to find the one answer but to bring forward the conversation because the you know the conversation brings lots of answers and lots of more questions and that's how we know things uh, knowledge doesn't ha necessarily have to be one solid objective thing at least that's what I what I think <laughs> No, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think that's the, uh, a strength of humanities that we are focusing the, the, the complex nature of the phenomena that we're studying. Uh, we're not trying to uh, simplify uh, what we're studying. But at the same time, uh, we also need to be able to, to provide some sort of answers to questions. Uh, we can't just say that, uh, well, everything is, is too complex uh, so we cannot say anything about it because then why are we f doing research on it um, so and I think that's um, and, and that's part of our job is to, to, to see the, the complex nature of the pheno phenomena that, that we're studying but still be able to uh, to try to, to distill or try to summarize the main trends in whatever it is that we're trying to to understand and usually we do that with the help of theories, yeah. and try to, to and methods. yeah, try to um, to uh, get to an answer to a very complex phenomena from a certain perspective. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, and also the fact that knowledge is a moving target. It means that we need to be able to have the proper methodology or theories to understand them. So it means that we have to be very critical, and also I, I guess that that also contributes to the you know the knowledge that uh, religious studies brings to the table so that mm, we are you know helping develop new methodologies uh, to understand knowledge and in its all complexity without trying to cut out things that are inconvenient or that are too difficult to understand mm -hmm. so yeah we are fun of religious studies <laughs> absolutely <laughs> So thank you so much, Herrick, for being here on, on my channel. It was a very uh, a fantastic conversation and very informative, I think. Uh, and for you, my kind viewer, don't forget to leave a comment because I, I want to know what you think about our conversation. Hopefully it was informative for you as it was for me. And thanks again, Eric, for being here. Thanks so much for being here. <laughs> and see you the next time. See you next time. Bye-bye.